Hello. I came across this picture in the Sunday Telegraph and, well, I've been to Ely Cathedral on several occasions. I love it. And this particular picture was full of the mystery and the beauty of that cathedral. And I did want to share that with you. Here's a, a better picture. Well, it's the same picture, but uh, expanded. And I thought I'd tell you about Ely Cathedral. Now, uh, I know this isn't my usual patch, but I mean, j just just look at it. How can you not try to talk about it. Uh, but before I do that, I shall tell you I'm Granny Opterix. I'm on YouTube, Rumble, Bitchute and Minds. I'm also on Twitter and Gab, where I let you know when I've uploaded new videos. Please like this video. Click like, share it, subscribe. If you're subscribed on YouTube, remember, click that bell button for notifications. You can also donate all the links are in the description. Right, I'll just get on with this. So, I saw this picture of Ely Cathedral and I thought I'd tell you about Ely. It's a, the town, the city, it's a city because it has a cathedral. Uh, it's a, a really small place. It really is no bigger than a small town. Um, uh, but because it's a cathedral, it, because it has a cathedral, it's a city. And uh, I think it qualifies as the second smallest city in the entire uh, United Kingdom. Anyway, I'll get into why. Uh, but before that, I want to tell you about that strange atmospheric look that is pretty well known in that part of the world. And so uh, let me uh, let me find that map for you. Right. So this is the east coast of England. And this was where a vast glacier during the last ice age carved its way across this whole area, came down uh, from the North Pole and ended up jamming itself against the moraine it, it had made just in front of London. All this stuff here is very flat, as Noel Coward remarked in, what was it, Private Lives? He said Norfolk, which is here. Very flat Norfolk. Well, yeah, this part of the world is also very flat. So here's Cambridge. Let's zoom in on that. And you can see there's Cambridge and there's Ely. It's still too small to have a name. Let's let's go one in. Right. And you can see that's the city limits, but most of it is not built up. There's that's all green there. So that's it's a short drive from Cambridge and it's in this area of uh, the country that we call the Fens. And it's very flat and it's very wet. Until the 17th century, th this, this bit here was called the Isle of Ely. And it wasn't called the Isle of Ely for fun. You, most of the time, you could only get to it by ferry until they drained this whole area in the 17th century, uh, inspired by Dutch uh, uh, the Dutch had been draining land for a long time and they used windmills. So all around here, there were many windmills uh, which were used mostly for drainage. There were windmills dotted all over the place. And then there was the great storm of 70... Hang on a minute, I have a Wikipedia thing here. The great storm, here we are. Let's... Uh, there. Great storm of 1703. And there was it was a storm that lasted from the end of November till well, mid-December or maybe late December. It just kept on blowing. And uh, what happened was that uh, 2,000 chimney stacks collapsed in London alone. And nearly all the windmills in this area were uh, destroyed. Uh, uh, Hang on, I've lost the map again. Oh, well, you'll just have to remember it. All the windmills were destroyed 
not that they were blown over, but that the wind made their sails go round so fast it's, they set light to themselves and burnt their their housings down. So, yeah, that's how bad the storm was. So they stopped the windmills and they found other ways, like sluices, of, uh, of uh, draining the fens. And the fens still have trouble with drainage and it's the land is often waterlogged and uh, there must be some crime fiction aficionados watching this video and you might remember a story by Dorothy Sayers featuring Lord Peter Whimsey. It's called The uh, the Nine Tailors and that featured drainage problems. It was set in the fens and the I think it was the culmination of the story was a horrendous flood and the sluice gave way and drowned a couple of people in the story. Uh, and I uh, now I'm going to riff onto a personal thing. I happened to be driving to Norfolk through that area and, and yeah, I was, I was uh, looking at a horse I wanted to buy, as a matter of fact. That was before I got my present horse. But anyway, we were driving along a road and both sides of the road. The road was slightly up from the the agricultural fields that stretched in a flat distance all around. But you couldn't see the fields. There was just water there. There'd been a re really bad set of floods and the all the fields were like mirrors on either side of the road. They were just, of course, there was no real disruption to the water, so it was completely f flat, completely clear. It was reflecting the sunny sky. By the time we were driving up there, the sky was blue and there were clouds, a few fluffy clouds in the sky. And there was this still water stretching out for miles on either side of the road, reflecting the sky. So it felt like we were riding or driving along a road that was completely disassociated from the earth, floating in a in a sky. The, the only reason we could tell we were still on land was that there were trees poking up through these mirrored surfaces. So we knew we knew the fields were still there. Otherwise we might even have had a spookier feeling about it. OK, so that's uh, the, the dampness of the fens. And uh, as you will see from this picture, the... Uh, do I have another, another mist? This is another view of the cathedral. And here's a, a pond. Uh, and uh, you, you can see the mist rising there. That was Ely. No... no uh, no bigger than a small town and yet and and suddenly you're struck by this gobsmackingly gorgeous cathedral and you may wonder why or how well the the thing is that ely was a very prosperous trading town in the middle ages you see it was surrounded by water and water was the best way to get around in uh, Britain at that time. Roads were very unreliable and, and dangerous, but uh, there were rivers and people would take stuff up and down the rivers. And Ely was right in the middle of what amounted to a big lake. And then you could get the stuff out to the... Oh, where's that map again? Yeah, here we are. So you could sail stuff up to the coast fairly easily, or you could get it a long way towards the coast for import and export or for taking to other places, for instance, like Cambridge, or starting on the road towards London. So uh, you, uh, you were in a good place in the Middle Ages in Ely. So, of course, if there's plenty of money, it usually means there's plenty of religion. It started off as a fairly modest abbey in the 7th century. It was founded by St. Ethelreda. I've got a picture of her here. 
Here you are. I don't know how much of a likeness that is, but uh, this uh, illustrator or illuminator of this manuscript obviously thought it was adequate. Uh, she had a very weird life. I'm not going to go into that, but really seriously weird. But at that time, uh, being a saint involved living a weird life. So, uh, yeah, well, what can I say? All right. It was founded in the 7th century century by St. Ethelreda, and then it was started as a cathedral in the early 11th century, 1081 to be precise, and it was finished about a hundred years later, just a little over a hundred years later. Obviously, everybody thought that Ely was the town of the future, and it was going to be very important for, for eternity, but somehow it got bypassed, which is not such a bad thing, because it didn't get ruined like a lot of other towns. It didn't get any Victorian restorations, for instance. And even during the Reformation, it it was more ignored than other elaborate cathedrals. The, the Lady Chapel was completely stripped because Lady Chapels were always highly decorated and had lots of statues and things. And th those were all broken down. So the Lady Chapel now is a very plain, uh, plain area. And there was a shrine too, St. Ethelreda there, that was also trashed in the Reformation. But apart from that, most of the cathedral was, was left to get on with things. So uh, we still have that. Now, I have an article here uh, from the BBC about the cathedral. And this is where you get a chance to, you will get a chance to see something of the inside. So here we are, and it says here, Ely Cathedral, with a crashing and banging, the bell tower fell. You see, what happened was this. This is the tower over the crossing. That's the bit where, you know, a cruciform church meets in the middle. And this here, there was a bell tower. Now, I've told you something about the fens and the water logging for a reason. And the reason is that the ground gets waterlogged. And so the foundations turned out not to be up to the job of supporting the bell tower. Uh, let the BBC carry on with this story. A cathedral is marking the anniversary of the collapse of its bell tower. Oh dear. Right, got it. Collapse of its bell tower, which fell with much crashing and banging 700 years ago today. The monks had been awaiting the disaster since cracks appeared in the stonework in 1321. And then the tower fell after shortly after the four o'clock in the morning prayers, matins, on the 13th of February, 1322. I'll bet the monks didn't have a very good Valentine's Day after that. What do you think? All right. Well, Ely Cathedral Guide. Oh, here. Uh, Mark Bradford said the monks had only just gone back to bed when the tower came down. Now, uh, you can notice that the stonework here on this tower looks completely different from the stonework of the rest of the cathedral. Uh, well, it was done at a different time. And it was using different materials. Uh, the monks were fully aware of the risks posed by the structure, and they'd been holding many of their daily services outside for that reason. Uh, what happened was they had been building that lady chapel and that made the tower unstable. It was a bell tower, though. So that means that there was a lot of vibration as well from the bells. He said they recorded the collapse with the following words. Scarcely had a few of the brothers got into bed and behold, suddenly all at once the bell tower fell with much crashing and banging as though there'd been an earthquake. Well, they rebuilt it. Just look at this beautiful, beautiful uh, lantern here. Uh, what they did was they put the bells in another tower and they built this and all of that up there is wood because... They didn't want to add to the weight. But I've got a little bit from another website about that. Within a year, they had a plan to rebuild bigger and better. Build back better. You see, 
that expression isn't as modern as you think. As rebuilding commenced, firmer foundations were found further out from the original pillars. And from this evolved the idea of building an octagon surmounted by a lantern. Well, in any case, an octagon would spread the weight more, wouldn't it, than a, a narrow tower. So that would have been part of the, the reason for the octagon. When I did a guided tour of the cathedral, the, the guide said that they decided on wood because it's lighter than stone. And uh, making a, with a span like that, the octagon was 74 feet wide and stone would have made it heavy and that would have given them the same problems again. Oh yeah, here, here it says 74 feet. Uh, it was too great to support a stone vault, and so it was built in wood and covered in lead. Uh, let's see. It cost £2,406, 6 shillings and 11 pence, equivalent to about £3.5 million pounds in today's money. Do you know what? You could spend £60 million pounds in today's money and you still wouldn't get something as beautiful as this. Uh, I have another detail of the lantern here. This is just gorgeous, isn't it? Ah, ah. And, and you can see the lantern there. Just look at this. I do urge you to see it if, if you get, if you get any sort of a chance here. Look at that. And that costs £3.5 million in today's money. You, you try and get that for £3.5 million now. And this is the stuff inside it. There were, uh, it. These oak beams, just think of it. They would have been seasoned before they were used for building. Now, I don't know how long you have to season an oak beam, but I could very well imagine it would be five years. It could even be more than that. The tower fell down in 1322. And then a year later, 1323, they were planning it. It means they started building 1324. So these beams would have, at the very least, been prepared in 1320. But then what they did was the, the 60 foot height there on the beams. The Victorians thought it was all one beam, but they were wrong. The, these things were so successfully spliced together, the Victorians didn't realize. But they were 40 foot beams and then 20 foot beams spliced into them. But whatever the size was, they were several hundred years old. Remember, they were at least five years old before they were used, I'm assuming. And then for a, an oak tree to get to 40 feet, well, well, it would have to be two or 300 years old. These trees could very well have been growing in the 10th century, the 900s. And you, you can stand there and you can look at them. These are part of the supports for the lantern. And you think these trees are well over a thousand years old. You, you get such a, a feeling of time and history when you visit places like that. Uh, what else do I have here? Um, this is what it looks like when you when you're standing there at the side of the lantern. You can look down there. Ah, oh, here. There's, I have another picture here of the lantern tower from the south. So you see, this is the older cathedral, and you can see the lantern is completely different, a completely different style. All right, well, that's my little take about Ely Cathedral and the beauty of that place and the history of that place and the proof of how medieval people were obviously 
far more sophisticated than we give them credit for. This is 14th century. It's absolutely astonishing. And, and I want to remind you of something else. One of the comments under one of my videos said uh, something like, uh, oh, well, I was talking about British culture and this person said, uh, you know, are you sure there is a British culture? Well, yes, there is. I've just showed it to you or some of it to you. We just have to remember that it's there. OK, till next time. Why not treat yourself or a favoured relative or friend to these magnificent examples of merch? The mugs and t-shirts come in the Granny Opteryx design or Granbo with a firearm or the more deadly knitting needles. Go to www.grannyopteryx.com and whatever platform you're watching this on, please click like subscribe and share, share, share.